such a cheap laugh. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Fix, the only show that unites the hard right and the soft left in unanimous scorn. As ever, we'll be covering some of the news stories that have caught our BD collective eye over the last couple of days. And seeing as it's ugh, Valentine's Day in a couple of days, I'm joined by Navarra Media romance correspondent Joanna Romero to talk about love, sex and the radical potential of neither. And just like we did a couple of weeks ago, we are going to be running an Ask Me Anything. So get stuck into the comments. Ask us questions about romance, about sex. Present us with your troubles and let us answer your queries with all the sensitivity that Navarra Media is famous for. A wealth of experience, really. On your side, I'm a nun. So, Joanna, why don't you kick us off? What new story has caught your eye this well, week? This is perhaps not very romantic, Ash, but it certainly uh, has created some uh, meltdowns on Twitter over the last 24 hours after it came to the fore that attendees to the upcoming Young Labour Equalities Conference, what a mouthful, uh, must be not only under the age of 27, Young Labour, but exclusively from minority groups, which is to say that only women, black and Asian and other minority ethnic, LGBT and disabled people can attend. Now, because among other things, these people are electing their representatives, the voices to be uh, for the coming year um, to help organize their identity based, um, you know, sort of events. Uh, it seems to be that a lot of the alt right has uh, felt a bit and conservative uh, opinions have uh, felt very offended by this. So cue a series of a said conservative alt right and just generic members of the white straight male defense league coming onto social media. And um, I mean, we had conservative MP James Cleverly suggesting that at a conference specifically focusing on electing young representatives um, of oppressed groups, you can't be a straight white man and be passionate about diversity. Um, whatever that's supposed to mean, as long as you're in the Labour Party, it seems. Or Breitbart assistant editor and uh, chief troll, Jack Montgomery, tweeting the Met Police and the Equality and Human Rights Commission on whether it was lawful to excluding or of excluding straight white men from these events. Um, now, honestly, Ash, I have uh, to ask you to explain this kind of outrage to me because, I mean, I just feel like we went into a vortex and the alt-right is all of a sudden even more idiotic <laughs> than I thought they were. So, I mean, this is a safe space for straight white men. We are joined by Captain Jean-Luc Picard and uh, we hold him in great esteem here. So this is a safe space. I mean, look, another day, another indignity for the straight white man. And I know that I've covered this extensively before when Ben Bradley MP, the other Tory eugenicist, got a bee in his bonnet about the West Mid Midlands Labour Conference, mm -hmm. which offered a discounted rate for black and Asian minority ethnic attendees. But I think that this is worth thinking about carefully because pushing a culture wars narrative that the left is intent on demonizing straight white men is becoming more and more central to conservative communication strategy. And let's be real, they're leaning hardest on the white bit of that formulation. They don't really care about the straight or the male so much because I've yet to see them kick off about the existence of gay bars or the Women's Institute or the Tories' own women to win schemes. The real beef is the idea that white people might not be welcome in all spaces. And this next bit is just for the white people now, so viewers of colour, go make a cuppa or listen to D'Angelo. I understand the pushback. I understand that lots of white people feel annoyed by the idea that they benefit somehow from their whiteness or that the presence of white people automatically means the presence of racism. I really understand that. But with all love and all kindness, this really isn't about you. Look, literally half of my family are white, ditto my circle of friends and roughly the same proportion of the Navarra media crew, and I still need spaces which are just people of colour to talk about what it's like to live under racism and for us to make decisions about ourselves without having to do a class in fuckeries 101. And it doesn't matter how woke a white person is on race, developing a friendship or a relationship of any kind where one person experiences an oppression on the basis of their identity and the other person doesn't is always a journey. 
there's conflict, there's misunderstandings, and there's sometimes even despair. And that process is definitely worth it. And personally, it's brought a lot of joy into my life, but it is work. When I got strip searched at an airport and my white friends didn't, explaining how that made me feel and the reasons behind what went down was work. Or when I'm with my white stepdad and I can detect hostility and he thinks that everything's just fine, that's work. Or when I was with an ex-boyfriend whose mates made racist comments and he found it funny or just silly, explaining that I wasn't going to put up with that was work. And doing that all the time is exhausting. And sometimes as people of colour, we just want a base level of understanding from the get-go. We don't always want to do all that talking and take all the time to make ourselves legible to white people. Sometimes our priority isn't to be understood by you, it's to understand ourselves. And if you're truly not a racist, which is what 99.9% .9 of white people say about themselves, then you'll be down with giving us just that little bit of space without any drama. Sounds so simple. Is Sounds it? so obvious. I mean, why do you think that um, the Tories are going so hard on these quite, I mean, no offence, piddly little conferences that previously people wouldn't really care about? I mean, I don't know what you think about it, but I suspect that there is a serious fear now that, you know, people are a bit more in tune with the fact that there is oppression going on. Surprise, surprise, you know, mm -hmm. some people don't have all the privilege. So, you know, some people do and then the rest of us don't. Um, and perhaps this is their last resort, you know, their sort of last cry to cur going, I mean, do you think it's because they've lost white man. the economic arguments so they're having to make these culture wars ones? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally can't see w why else they would really cling at straws at this point uh, and, and have a go at, you know, Young Labour Equalities Conference. I mean, and you saw it across the media as mm. well. You know, it's not just people on Twitter, I think it should be said. Um, the Times picked it up and ran with the, it. The, the Evening Standard did as well, a big mm -hmm. piece as well, uh, and so on and so forth. So, I just, I, you know, it boggles the mind. Um, How it, effective do you think it's going to be? I suspect it won't be very effective because it's such a ridiculous argument. I mean, in, as you pointed out just now, there are so many forums in which we keep it as a safe space to a certain identity, why all of a sudden an equalities conference should be the bastion for, you know, all access to everyone, including the incredibly privileged white, uh, straight male, and probably, I suspect, from a lot of, certainly from the conservative tweets, these are upper middle class white straight males. Well. James Tevely, must be said. <laughs> Fine. Uh, he has no excuse, he's just an idiot. Uh, but yeah, so that's true, yeah. Uh, perhaps doesn't fit the whole, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, I feel like so shocked at times with these things, because it's nobody would say, particularly if you find yourself, and, and you point out this question around race, you know, I think it's predominant here, because again, if this is, was a women's only uh, space, nobody would probably have flinched an eye. And all of a sudden they're making a big issue about white men cannot be included in a discussion around diversity. I mean, the thing is, no one's saying that they can't. It's just that this one space isn't for you. I mean, there are all manner of events and panels and films and documentaries and books and reading lists that white people can access to learn about racism. This is just one conference. One conference. I, I mean, it's also so uh, facetious in the sense that, you know, like white men can be gay, as you went mm -hmm. out, can be disabled. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many, you know, can be trans. Mm -hmm. There's so many elements of that in which it's not necessarily white males barred at the door. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's just, it clearly is a, a conference that probably uh, it only excludes those who ultimately speak every single day above every other voice. And so, so that the, you know, there's a bit of silence from that uh, corner of the room. Well, tell you what, there yeah. is a reason to be cheerful. There is. Because actually, it's all going to be fine. Because last week, a discovery was made that has meant that racism is ended forever. Can we roll the clip? This is what people look like in Western Europe and Britain 10,000 years ago, not what we would have expected. One, two, three, come on! <laughs> Reconstruction, so look at it. This guy has a, a spark. 
So, a team mapping ancient DNA at the Natural History Museum presented evidence that the Cheddar Man, a 10,000 year old uh, mummified body, well, skeleton, the remains of one of the first settlers of Britain, whereas I always thought that Cheddar Man always sounded a bit like your weed plug, but okay, um, had dark to black skin, black curly hair, and blue eyes rather than fair skin and light hair. That's, you know, for the most part been assumed in scientific circles up till now. So, Joe. Talk me through some of the reactions to this. It's interesting because it's kind of connected to what we were talking before in terms of race, for sure. Because I think the first wing thing we can take away from this um, is that the Cheddar Man has, until now, been depicted as this sort of white-bearded, rather scruffy-looking dude. Um, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> uh, well, clearly not. Jeremy Corbyn is not our forefather, it turns out. Uh, shocker. Um, Just our political father. Indeed. Uh, great guidance. Um, basically, th this whole story is more of an, an indicative of the way in which British identity is really constructed um, on sort of, you know, a, a rhetoric um, around whiteness rather than actual scientific fact. You know, if, if we've been thinking about the Cheddar Man up until this point, till DNA had to be traced as um, a white dude, why is that? Um, and um, and I said, like, you know, people, I, I suspect, I'm no scientist, but I suspect that so far, I, mean, I guess, I mean, I am a political scientist, journalist, That's whatever. not real science. Anyway, yeah, no, no, not according to, uh, to most. Anyway, the point is that I think people have been thinking of the Cheddar Man as this white dude because of British chauvinism. You know, it's, it tells Britons what they should be. White, constantly, all the time. Um, and for a country in which the rhetoric is, uh, and this question of like British values and, and you know, what being British is so often, um, even if unspokenly linked to whiteness and indeed to white supremacy, um, this is one of those like hilarious and delicious plot twists. You know, you can see uh, the BNP members crawling uh, <laughs> around their houses uh, in, you know, raging. Uh, so, what have some of these reactions been like? Well, uh, I think the first reaction that we've seen is really a question of, of just proof that the British society is still incredibly racist. Sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's the more subtle comments from Piers Morgan making these uh, connections between Lord Sugar's uh, tan and, and the Cheddar Man's obviously darker skin. Um, but then you have, like, full-blown racism. Like, I think there's someone blocked of Twitter after photoshopping a picture of the uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle... Uh, Engagement pictures, yeah. yeah. Uh, replacing Meghan Markle, a uh, mixed race uh, American, with an image of the reconstructed uh, Cheddar Man. So, you know, that's been that sort of full blown, in your face uh, horrendousness. Um, and if you're asking me whether racism is yet dead and buried, I'm sorry to like ruin a few guys, but I don't think so. And that's no proof shit. of it. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, and, and actually, the, the, the Silver lining, in a sense, although this might sound uh, like uh, a bit naff. I mean, there's definitely a reason to celebrate this discovery because, in a time in which anti-immigrant sentiment and again white supremacist white supremacist rhetoric has been seemingly increasing all the time, certainly on on you know national media, there's been a lot of people giving spaces to very very horrendous opinions. Um, the Cheddar Man. Not just Navarra Media. <laughs> not just Navarra Media, for sure. Definitely not Navarra <laughs> Media. Come on, we're great. Um, anyway, it just kind of comes to prove, Cheddar Man just comes to prove once again that actually this country is based on diversity, on the work of people who are not white, um, who have traveled around, and, uh, you know, much like any other country, um, you know, the, the people actually made it and. You know, the reason why we're here is because of people who are not necessarily the ones that are represented to, represented, representative of our you know, leadership structures or uh, mainstream media and so, and so forth. So, you know, dark skinned, uh, uh, blue, blue eyed, blue eyed ancestors. I mean, like, I mean, you know, what? because there are enough South Asians from where I grew up who are like putting contacts on their eyes to look just like Cheddar Man. Basically, it turns out. basically just want to be the, the you know, the, the essential British. The exactly. Original. Exactly. I mean, so here's the interesting thing, right? So Cheddar Man is an ancestor for one in 10 white Britons in this country. And what does this tell us? I why, don't... why do you still tan so badly? I mean, why? Well, not me. No, but I mean, these, these <laughs> white people going on about, you know, like how, how can it be that the original Britain is, uh, is a black man? 
I mean, the thing is, and I think that even the terminology that we use is out of date, right? Because mm. what this shows us is that race as a socially constructed technology mm. of governance where we assign cultural meaning and group belonging to phenotypic indicators like skin colour, mm. hair colour, hair texture, mm. eye colour is relatively modern. Mm. It's relatively new. So... This is the, you know, the stuff of centuries rather than millennia. Mm. And to be honest, we didn't have to go as far back as the Cheddar Man. I love saying Cheddar Man so much. Like, it sounds like my future husband, like a man made of cheddar. Um, call me boo. Um, the great thing, we don't have to go as far back as Cheddar Man. So have you heard of Septimius Severus mm. before? Yeah. So he was a Roman emperor who was just bopsing about Hadrian's Wall back around 2nd century uh, AD, and he was born in North Africa. Um, the images of him show him with, you know, dark, somewhat curly hair. So, you know, we don't know what he'd look like if he'd looked like someone we would now label as black or if he'd looked maybe more like, you know, Maghrebi or something. But um, it just shows us that this uh, link of phenotyped power position, relatively new, and me and Karem Nijanjolu discussed this on The Invention of Whiteness. It's a Navara FM podcast that we did a couple of years ago. And quite, to be quite honest with you, it's one of the um, pieces of work for Navara that I'm proudest of. And what we do is we sort of trace the beginnings of how people come to think of culture as being hereditarily transmitted. And it becomes this taxonomy of race Right back to the kind of, you know, 15th century, we look at Ottoman expansion, we look mm. at the transatlantic slave trade, we look at um, the Spanish conquest of the Americas, and we also look at, um, a bit earlier than that, uh, the expulsion of the Jews, the expulsion of the Moriscos, and we look at the reconquest of Al-Andalus. So if you're interested in how race becomes socially constructed, which isn't the same as not real, has very real social effects, um, listen to this podcast. I was just going to ask, I mean, ultimately, doesn't this just prove again that white identity is premised very much on whitewashing a series of really important characters? I mean, we could even talk about Jesus Christ at this point. Mm -hmm. Part fiction, part real, whatever. Um, but 100% like Palestinian. But exactly, uh, you know, or, you know, St. George and so on and so forth. I mean, all these characters that clearly were not necessarily the blonde, blue-eyed, white men, li literally white knights, yeah. uh, and then who just been appropriated, literally. I mean, that's probably. the thing, is that whiteness has to be read retrospectively back onto history, mm. right? So if we think about it as the product of a particular historical time period, you have to read it back. And... I think what the Cheddar Man discovery does do, and I think that this is something which um, I don't think necessarily means that race relations, um, if you can say that there are race relations in this country, um, necessarily changes that much, but it shifts our idea of what the universal backdrop mm. is, right? Because even in 2017, 2018, we're thinking that whiteness is the universal backdrop and then anything else is a yeah, deviance the default, from that. Yeah. Whereas this has just completely inverted that in a way that I think is quite interesting. Yeah. So we are about to go to a little break. And when we come back, you better have loads of really uncomfortable questions for us. Because otherwise we're just going to be talking about our own sex lives and that's even worse. I'm okay so, with that. See you right back. <laughs> Over the last 10 years, things have really changed. Us. It's about us. But for all of the darkness, every cause has an effect. 40 years on the roof of Melbank. For all the talk of change, the present moment is really one of crisis. A crisis of democratic representation. Of identity. A climate crisis. Of a failing economic model which isn't working for most people. We can't have a media that's beholden to advertisers or the political ambitions of oligarchs. Which is why, in 2013, we founded Navara Media. Unlike corporate media, we are funded by our subscribers. There's no tax avoiders, there's no oil money, and there's no lords. What we're creating is media for you, which quite simply, you make possible. We're looking to raise £40,000. That will allow us to not only keep on paying our contributors, but give them a little bit more, as well as keep our studio and take our fantastic Navarra events nationwide. To help us get there, go to support.navarramedia.com and give a one-off donation, or even better, sign up for a subscription. We've already achieved so much, but the truth is, we've barely started. 
Okay, so now that Valentine's Day, that delight of socially constructed climates of romance is just around the corner. Um, I thought we needed to say something about it on Avara. I mean, come on. We just had you and Aaron Bastani talking about dating tips just the other day. So this is the week to do it, really. Come on. Um, but I personally actually hate the damn thing. I write about sex all the time and I'm happy to talk about my sex life. Uh, Go on, but I beans. hate Valentine's Day with a vengeance because invariably, I mean, I'm a horrible romantic and invariably every single Valentine's Day, there I am waiting for my Valentine's card. Nothing comes, no flowers or nothing. It's so sad. Wah, wah, wah. Anyway, so the way I've found uh, to circumvent that is to actually talk about the last remaining bastion of subversiveness when it comes to dating which is sex really effectively and even that has been very often co-opted by um capitalist system uh and you know what's most shocking ash it's recently I was, i've been writing an article for navara which should be dropping on the website any minute now and uh and i explore the fact that i've realized recently that no matter where if you're a woman no matter where you turn in terms of your sex life you're uh you're uh, screwed over and uh, by, by the system, which means that on the one hand, you're told constantly that you're meant to be this virginal, you know, sort of Madonna type, if we're gonna use the, the old Freudian trope of the Madonna versus the whore. Um, on the other, if, you know, if you're really being encouraged by uh, Western media, and if you're in charge of your sexuality, more often than not, you are depicted and you engage with other people within their sexuality, not just self-love. Um, you're sort of encouraged to be a bit of a man-eater. And the problem with that, whilst it gives you, or you as a woman or any woman, uh, a bit more space, um, and it uh, avoids the prudish mores that our society still sort of uh, applies on to us all the time, it kind of ends up mimicking a lot of that, you know, capitalist accumulation and, and commodity fetishization. You're effectively accumulating dick. Um, so at least that's how I feel. Uh, so, so yeah, so it's this sort of horrendous uh, discovery, really, for me, that no matter where I turn as a woman, my sexuality or my sex life is fucked over by capitalism and co-opted and restricted and construed. Um, and so there's really only one way to escape it, which is to burn it with fire, abolish capitalism once and for all, and the patriarchy as an artifact of capitalism on that. So that's how I, that's how I escape. And that's a date activity to burn it all down and abolish capitalism. It's my motto. But you know, you mentioned um, being prudish and repressed. I think our viewers are a bit prudish and repressed because we've only had one question so far. <gasps> so get on it, send them in. I want to know your business. And tell you what, while we kill a little bit of time, mm. I'm going to be a little bit sincere for a minute, if I can be a bit sincere for a minute. Go for it. So uh, gather around the hearth, children, because this doesn't happen very often. Because when you're not in a relationship, Valentine's Day, can feel very bleak, it can feel very alienating, and it's difficult. But romance is not the be-all and the end-all of love. And I like to think of love as the modality in which solidarity is lived. There's a terrific love poem by Asata Shakur who wrote that love is contraband in hell because love is an acid that eats away bars. And this wasn't just an artful metaphor for her. When she and her family were being surveilled, harassed or having the brakes of their car cut or threatening letters sent by law enforcement, she wrote that their attempts to destroy family unity, to make people afraid to even have a relationship with her, didn't work. She wrote, we survived it. We resisted together. We struggled together and that has made us, all of us, much more serious about who we are and about our love for each other. And I think when you stop a charter flight from taking off and deporting asylum seekers, that's love. When you protest against deaths in police custody, that's love. Joining a picket line is love. Canvassing your neighborhood is love. And any act of resistance where you choose not to hate those who the far right tell you to hate is love. And in a much less lofty sense, it's okay to feel nervous about being single as well. Loneliness is as much a part of the human condition as love is, and it's only through being honest with yourself that it's possible to find any kind of comfort. But really confronting your fear of being alone is one of the best things you can do, I think, especially if you're a woman. Independence, I wouldn't give it up even for Anthony Joshua now. And I think 
as women, we're so used to pouring in love and time into a romantic relationship or the possibility of one, and you can risk losing yourself. And I know that I did. And so I guess what I'm saying is that with or without a partner, you are enough. Whatever you're feeling, that's cool. Go for dinner with your honey, stay at home, have a wank, smoke a spliff, or go out and get wavy with the mandem. It's all good. At the end of the day, it's just Wednesday. Happy Valentine's Day, scumbags. I think I'm going to cry a little bit. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was the most beautiful. I mean, like, just, I do weddings, bar mitzvahs, wakes, <laughs> if you need a bit of speechifying. Yeah. I'm not sure how many questions we've got. We definitely have um, mm. one. Ooh, okay, all right. Go on. Hit me. So, we've got uh, from Mark Richardson. I'm terrible with people and can't get a date. Well, Mark, what Let's can we advise? Let's stare into the camera. Right. So, Mark, so I don't know what, what could te being terrible with people mean. Well, yeah, precisely. It depends. Like, are you terrible with people that you feel shy or are you terrible with people that, um, I don't know, you piss on their leg when you see them, like, straight away because then don't do that. That's... Um, yeah, off-putting. Um, I mean, some anxious? people might be into that, though. You Don't you no have to shaming. ask first? No, you would have to ask You first. know, I'm really bad for kink-shaming. But they say can't get a date. How Do you ask people on dates, Mark? I mean, we need more information here to be able to advise Is you. Is this a question of, like, not knowing what kind of icebreaker to use? Uh, okay, what that, good that icebreakers? Well, you know what? Like, oh God, I can't believe I'm actually giving this sort of advice. I mean, I tend to do things like... Go to, when I when it's at the bar, like old school type, which rarely happens nowadays, really. Um, ask someone uh, for a drink. I saw this from a uh, horrendous uh, uh, confession here. I actually read about this by some sort of uh, you know self help advisor when it comes to romance. And it was it Jordan Peterson? No, it was Matthew Hussey, I think. Anyway, um, and he suggested, and I tried this out, it actually works. So. Um, you talk to someone at the bar when you first go to get a drink that you fancy, if you fancy them, and then you kind of leave it at that. And then at the end of the evening or whatever, you go back to it. And it kind of feels like you've built a rapport because it wasn't right straight in your face. And to be fair, if you're in a straight dynamic and you're a man and you want to approach a woman without getting her to run for the hills, because to be honest, that's very often the reaction I have when any man approaches me in a, a situation that is already, you know, sensorially overwhelming as a pub or a club or something, it's actually a really easy approach to, to talk to someone very briefly at the beginning and then maybe at the end. And remember, if she still leaves, it's not you. It's just she's not interested and you should definitely not insist. You know what? You know what I think um, is helpful advice? Maybe. I'm not sure. Is you, What I find really, really attractive, like as a quality, and I know it when I see it, even though it can manifest itself in different ways, in different guys, is... Money. Oh, no, not just money. Um, when, when a man is... Honesty. <laughs> um, I like it. As well as money. Is um, when a man is really, like, settled and secure in himself. So sometimes that can manifest in a guy sometimes being a bit reserved because he doesn't feel that he has to, like, dominate every space. Or sometimes they can be really enthusiastic. But I think people can detect inauthenticity straight away. So, mm. Mark, if you feel that you're terrible with people and that means that you feel you're just, like going through personas like it's I don't know a deck mm. of cards or something stop doing that like have a real careful think about the kind of person you are and just let it out and people will see it and they'll appreciate that people really like mm. um a sense of solidness in who you are and failing that get rich yeah, I can't argue with the rich one. It kind of helps. I'm uh, reaching, reaching 30 and suddenly realizing that a bit of cash is helpful. Mark says that he doesn't piss on people's legs, oh, which good. is great. <gasps> Ooh, from Francis Smith. Oh, go on. This is one for you. For me? Is Joanna free on Valentine's Day? Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm right. actually not. Sorry. Sorry, I'm not. But that said, it's a sort of Galentine's thing that I'm doing. So, Francis is a man or a woman? I can't see uh, how it's spelled. It's Francis with an I, so I think, I think oh. Francis is a man. Um, so, sorry, you're not. Another, another exclusive uh, uh, realm, safe space just for women. Um, so, yeah. Busy. Oh, okay. Katerina Annis. I've just found out that the guy I like is an evangelical Christian. <gasps> Should I avoid like the plague, even though he is otherwise woke? And I've already named our future children. 
What would you do? I, I had an interesting experience this summer. I met a man who was very good looking. Uh, marvelous kisser. And, um, but he was a big Catholic. Uh, so he had reincarnated. What, like how big? Like the Pope? Like close to it, except that he was like woke in the sense that he also didn't want to ascribe a gender to God. So God could be a woman. I don't I don't want to out him too much here. But anyway, and I thought, you know what? I, I was raised a Catholic and I, I fled it like the plague. So more often than not, my knee-jerk reaction is, uh, this man is a Christian of some description. I'm not into that. I've had enough of that for 15 years of my life. Um, but I thought, you know what? He seems really cool um, and he's so good looking. I'm going to give it one spin. Um, and then I never did because turns out that his religiousness really impinged on his views on me and my open sexuality uh, and how of an emancipated woman I am. And, uh, and so it ended up actually ruining things quite a lot. So suss it out, Katerina, first. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe your bae is great, um, but it might happen that his religious views end up tinging a lot of his other views. Um, and you know what? You know what? I think if you've already picked out some children's names, then it's a shame to put them to waste. So what you say to your man, Katarina, is you go, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I beseech you, leave your genetic material on the table and go. And then you tell oh, him to go. Yeah, I mean, if he's very good looking, for sure, for sure. I mean, you know what? It, I, I I'm, st I'm still reeling at the fact that I didn't give that man a spin at the end, to be fair, so. A spin? Yeah, like I wanted to, you know, try it out. A spin? Like when we were kissing. How does one spin? Am I, I know what I am mean. I doing I'm, this wrong? I'm using the euphemisms. Oh, okay, so there's not oh. actual spinning involved. Well, there might be. Can there be? It could be. Anyway, the point I was making is that, like, you know, when we're I have making so out, I, I could feel things and I'm like, oh, I really want to try this out, and then I never did. So, so definitely, Katerina, give it a go if you feel like it's worth it. You know what? Sure. I've actually, um, when I've like met guys who are much better Muslims than me, because I'm a really, really terrible Muslim, is that I've sometimes felt like, you know what, I'm going to leave this one for Allah. Like, I don't want to corrupt you, so I'm just going to leave you in the arms of God where I found you. And hopefully that will be enough to get me into heaven when... You know, there's someone with like a checklist like of all the bad it, yeah. things they've done. You're checking all the bases. I mean, there might be God, there might not be a God, but in any case, you're, you know. I mean, I, I'm almost certain that there is a God because one time um, I found a £20 note on the floor. Ooh, Ooh okay. another question. We've got two oh, questions. Really okay, tell what, we've got one, one which is a very specific one. Lauren Crawford, there's someone I fancy at my local momentum group, Ooh. but all they ever want to do is talk about the Labour Party. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. I like that. I love political pillow talk. Um, I mean, I kind of, there's only so much Labour Party talk that I can handle, at, whether in Navarra or on a date. So if basically you want to move things on to, um, like, more productive territory than the Labour Party, which is basically like, are you going to bang dough? You can just ask, are you going to bang dough? Or what you can do is, I'm all about plausible, deniable dates, like plausibly deniable dates. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, yo, do you want to come do this thing? Mm -hmm. And it's like an activity. Yeah. But it's not like, oh, let's like canvas or like or whatever. It's like, it's kind of fun, but related to the activity that you already enjoy Socials. doing. Socials. Momentum socials. No, don't go to a momentum social. I mean, like, go to an exhibition or something. I've and done it. It worked for me. Everything works for you. It's not true. Like, she looked like I'm that. still Everything single. Works for her. Which, which actually contradicts you what you were saying before, which is like, I should not define someone myself on my relationship. Someone asked you out on this. No. I'm sorry, Francis. I'm so sorry. Anyway, I just think, like, take him on, like, a plausibly deniable date. Exhibitions are really good. And then you go for a drink afterwards. And then you just see how it goes. And then when it gets to, like, you know, closing time or something, then you're like, are we going to bang? And then if he's like, uh, no, you're like, oh, obviously I was joking. And then if he's like, oh, we could bang, then you'd be like, yeah, we bang. I see. That's another tip I have. I do that often. I go on a date or a semi-date or whatever. And then if nothing happens, because for some reason I couldn't get there, but I felt there was still potential, I text them afterwards going, oh, it's such a shame. I thought we we're going to kiss. And then if they say, uh, no, I didn't get that vibe. I was like, oh, I'm so tipsy. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah. Oh, one from James Hardy. Have either of you ever seen Aaron Bastani in The Buff? Um, he's like my big brother, 
So when he was skinny dipping on Brighton Beach, it was intensely traumatic for me and I wiped it from my memory. Um, okay, what have we got here? We've got from <laughs> The Fix's own Michael Walker. Best app to find a Valentine's date? Question mark. Are shout outs for partners on Twitter socially acceptable? Best app to find a Valentine's date? I reckon go for Twitter, actually, Michael. Um, I, I always say no to people who ask me out on Twitter. Nah, you've got to do, um, what you've got to do is like a little bit of banter. And then what, then the key to get someone to do a DM slide, mm -hmm. I've worked this out, yeah. is um, you trail off on the like verbal banter and you just do a gif. So the flirty one where Rihanna's like failing to wink, that's like really good and then someone jumps in your DMs and then Michael, I'm sure you can take up from there. Are shout outs for a partner on Twitter socially acceptable? Um, no, not specific ones where it's like, I am lonely and my ankles are behind my ears. Um, that's probably a bit too much. But if you're like, oh, what, what are yeah. people saying tonight? Mm. That's also like a, plausible deniability again, key. Also like a you know, like a low key uh, thirst trap is always welcome. I mean it's part and parcel of being a millennial, no? A low key thirst trap. Yeah. I like a high key thirst trap. Yeah, you trap. do. I you like do a, a good ones as I, well. But then the thing is Big is that I don't do anything. If someone slides into my DMs, I'm then like I'm too afraid. Um, we've got one from Hannah Shake. Men keep dumping me because I am spooky. What's a girl to do? Girlfriend, you're not spooky. You're just being a strong woman, I'm sure. Like, men bail all the freaking time. Well, it depends. Like, maybe she's got, like, a mouthful of pigeon's blood or something. Uh, Which is cool. Where do you get these ideas from, Ash? She so said random. she used the word spooky. Well, spooky could be just, like, you know, her being really real. I get dumped all the time by men who just can't handle how, you know, fierce and outspoken I am and how many other dicks I've seen before them, to be fair. And I I'm get, okay with that. You know what? I get dumped when men realize that their wallet's missing. <laughs> I've never tried that. I should really start. <laughs> As well, I'm broke. I'm really... like, this Domino's ain't paying for itself. Yeah, like I'm a freelance writer now. I really need to start stealing some men's wallets. But you know but what, I'm Hannah? Like, like, Hannah, I reckon you just go out with a man who's just as spooky as you. Because mm. look, if you're... If you're basically a warlock, my love, why are you going out with a man who looks like Abercrombie and Fitcher model? You mm. don't need that. Find someone as spooky as you. There's actually, oh my God, a friend of mine went home with a guy because she's like a bit gothy. Even though she's very sweet looking, she's like a bit gothy. She went home with a guy and it turned out that he lived like above a morgue and she was quite into it. Yeah, yeah. Would you be into that? I, I personally... I don't know if I would or not, although I do like a bit of spook on the side. But I, I do know someone who was caught um, having sex in a graveyard. Yeah. Because uh, their partner had a heart attack. The partner was <laughs> a bit older and she had to call an ambulance. <gasps> So this is this is back in the back in the homeland, back in Portugal, of course, of course. And it was a small village as well, so apparently it became a big deal. Um, Those are two good yeah. stories. Yeah. In oh, I have one loads of story. these. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm only ashamed that it didn't happen to me. Have so you like, ever, why is it not me? Have you ever injured anyone during sex? Uh, I've injured myself once. I've also gone for it injured. Anyway, mm -hmm. what a keen trooper I am. Uh, I don't know if I've ever injured anyone. Uh, oh, I'm sure I once like elbowed or something or need someone in the midst of passion, but that was as bad as it got. Um, um, yeah, happens. I, I, um, I elbowed someone in the nose and. I, I, I bet you were hoping that I would say like, oh, I broke their dick one day. Yeah, I, 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 I want to hear something like really salty. No. I haven't heard any really good injury stories. Actually, no. I had another friend, this is when I was at school, she broke her collarbone um, when she lost her virginity because like, you know, they were trying to move and then she fell off what the bed and broke her collarbone. Okay. I was thinking like, where was he doing it that the collarbone was, okay, they fell off the bed. Okay, they fell off the bed. Okay. Um, but it healed and it didn't put her off for life. Um, we have another query, uh, oh, from Gary McQuiggan, elbows are sexy. He's our videographer, so you know you didn't have to send me that, bro. Um, Emma Wary, my friend is obsessed with a guy, but I think he might be a Scientologist. How Oof. can I get her out of no, it? No, that's definitely like, no. That's okay, no, but she needs the concrete advice. How does she get her friend out of it? I mean, what is the friend seeing in the Scientologist? What is the attraction? Again, is it because like he has an amazing booty? Or, or is There's it because of his views? There's always a better booty. There's no, always a better that's booty. That's absolutely true. I agree, but... Emma, you go for a two-pronged attack, my friend. What you do is, prong number one, you 
don't slag off this guy at Definitely. all. Definitely. Because that's just going to drive her closer towards him. Yeah. You're just like, oh my God, I'm really excited for you. He sounds really great and healthy and not spooky at all. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> right? So you take out any elements of like drama or forbidden whatever. And then you locate a more intriguing, better hung, better booted man. And you just you move them into the same room and you shut the door. Yeah, that sounds like a task and a half. That's how but, I get yeah. my friends over someone that I don't like. Did that work? It always works. Why don't you find me someone? You know what? I have a 100% success rate. I set up two of my friends, and now they're married. And I set up another two of my friends. Oh, no, I introduced them. I'm taking too much credit for This is an advertisement for and, Ash Sarker's, uh, uh, you know, And, like, they live together. Dating. They've been together for five years. So I've got 100% set up success rate. Start, start a business girlfriend, honestly. I'm terrible at it. What's I'm, your type? I'm, my type, mm -hmm. uh, bearded intellectual scruffy. I mean, like, I'll show you. I have a collage of all the men I slept with. If oh you're God. in it. Um, oh, uh, Chris Skane, how do, I, how do I meet girls who are into fully automated luxury communism? Well, that one's easy, Chris. You come to any one of Navarra Media's events. But also, don't act up and be a creep, because then we'll kick you out. Come, <laughs> be respectful, do those moves that Joanna was telling you about, and then you'll meet some nice girls yeah, who are into chill. Falk. But um, don't be a creep about it. Yeah. Uh, was I helpful? Be chill. Um, I think actually on that note, like I think for people who feel that, you know, I'm not meeting the right person, all the people I meet are wrong, like just go to the things you like and meet people who like the same things. More often than not, that's how it works really well. But you know what? I don't even do that. I go to cool things and I meet nice people and then I don't sleep with any of them. Um, and that, my friends, is the source of all my power. But I'm afraid we're running out of time before I can go into the virtues of living like a nun. We will be here. Same time, same place, but next week. Um, we've been The Fix, and you've been excellent. Bye-bye.